Kisov shoots it to play. Good right in. Peter Angelo save rebound. Stastny stopped by Peter Angelo. I don't believe that save. Even as Peter Stastny. He can't believe the save that Peter Angelo just made on him as Frankie Sparkling. Now that maneuver there to stop and rob Peter Stastny. He should get 5 to 10 for that. Oh. Hello and welcome to episode 93 of Tendy Talk, presented by the Hockey Podcast Network and the BLPA Podcast Networks. I'm your host Joe, better known as Wash Up Goalie on social media. This week, I chat with Dylan Waugh. I think that's how you pronounce his last name, we never really got around to that part. A fellow goalie on the THPN Network from the Hockey Unfiltered Podcast. So, without further ado, let's get to the conversation with Dylan. <laughs> So let's give that a second. All right, Dylan. Hey, thanks for joining me on the podcast. Good to uh, connect with another THPN uh, podcaster. Yeah, g- give me just one second. I'm just, I had this and now I don't have it. Yeah. Well, and you just got off the ice too. So you got that going on. Literally just got off the ice. So, uh, and I'm not going to be home anytime soon. So I'm just like, <laughs> pulling over in the car, brought the mobile set up. <laughs> no worries. I, rig. I appreciate the dedication. Oh man. Always. Right. Yeah. So how, how was the, uh, the skate? Uh, skate was good. Um, it was with a team, uh, out here. How the heck did I do this? Oh, is that what I did? Yeah. I was going to say, I see That's you great right there. Yeah. There we go. All right. <laughs> I like my Ontario show every once in a while, you know. There we go, bud. Yeah, a goalie <laughs> and the Ontario side of you. So, yeah, I mean, I mean it's it's a miracle you're on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, so that's uh, – is that all right? That, that's not too bad, eh? No, you, you look look good for a goalie. <laughs> I'm parked next to a, a lamppost <laughs> to give it some lighting. Yeah, hey, it works. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Hollywood uh, directors would be jealous of the lighting right now. Oh yeah, I mean they always try to go for this shadow across the face look to make it look look more uh, yes. ominous or mysterious, right? And so that's me just naturally. Yeah, lurking in the shadows, waiting to stop pucks. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. world's one of goaltending. <laughs> so you were just on the ice, not uh, playing, but coaching. Uh, what what level are you coaching? I coach uh, a lot of different levels. Um, this was uh, a girls double A team. Uh, and I'm not sure how it works, you know, around uh, other parts. Are we live? Is this is, is this the podcast? Yeah, I, so I, I do let it go live just because, hey, I work in marketing, so I know for SEO purposes it's good for me. But uh, I I post everything um, later on uh, for the audio side of things. Oh, okay, but but I, I'm I'm speaking now for posterity's sake is what I'm I'm trying to. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I thought we were just chit chatting. All right. Uh, yeah. And so I don't know how it works in other places, but uh, but double A is as high as as girls hockey goes here. And okay. so, uh, yeah, there's a couple, couple good goaltenders and, uh, you know, it's always fun to be on the ice with them. So I, when I was in college, I, w- I would work our summer hockey camps and, you know, we, we had boys weeks, we had girls weeks. And the one thing I noticed in the difference between coach and the two is boys, you had to tell them to do the same thing over and over. Girls, you just had to tell them to do a bunch of different things. They got it on the first <laughs> try, but then they did something else where you're like, no, we got to correct this. Where, you know, it's, it's really interesting going back and forth coaching the two I learned. Um, yeah. and I, I think it makes you a better coach of learning how to deal with the two different um, uh, personality types of, of the goaltender. I think that um, I think that the gender divide is lessening a lot in hockey as because i i remember listening to uh, brianne mclaughlin on Mm -hmm. in still there yeah i'm so there you're breaking up just a little bit but not not bad hey yeah i'm here yeah i remember listening to brianne mclaughlin on in goal magazine talking about the difference between uh 
coaching because she coached in, in the men's national team and also the women's national team and played, of course, women's hockey. Yeah. Um, and I remember her talking about the difference, and she was just like, uh, you know, how it was a lot more ex- uh, explanation went into coaching women's hockey, and it was, you know, a little bit more nuanced, I guess, would be the word. But I think that um, where we are right now is that when I coach the boys, they they're no longer like what how you would have come up and how I would have come up where it's kind of like robot do 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 they're no longer that way and and the girls in my opinion are are becoming more like that to to one extent or another but I think that you know the fundamentals of coaching and, and it, it's it seems it's very very similar right now it's it doesn't have the same difference that I've heard other people talk about from what I've observed in in the younger generation it's uh it's very it's it's all it's all the same stuff you know communicate well sometimes you've got to be hard on them sometimes you've got to go easy on them sometimes you've got to make fun of them sometimes you've got to get made fun of goalie yeah. coaching is so unique and wonderful and i love it because it, it, you've got a real relationship with your students compared to you do. like a, a player coach has you know 20 people to yell at Right. And so they can't let this guy get away with garbage because then the next one wants to. Whereas for a goalie coach, you know, I I don't have to worry about the same respect boundaries. Right. In the sense of I'm not worried. Like, I'm not worried if if a goalie gets frustrated and skates off and and just like in a huff. I'm not so worried about that. I can have that conversation later with that goaltender. And the goalie partner is not going to be like, well, they can do what I can do, it kind of thing, right? Right. And you're so true because I coached high school hockey when I was some playing college for a while. And I had the goalies where I had to put my arm around them and console them if he was having a rough <laughs> day in practice or, you know, if he was having a bad game. I really had to, you know, go with the positive reinforcement, be very gentle with them. But then yeah. his goalie partner, you know, I could look and be like, get your head out of your ass here. You dumbass. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I know. I don't know what's wrong with me. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. you know like, like you said, when, you, when you're coaching the greater team, you have to treat everybody the same. But the goalies, for whatever reason, we know we're different. And, and as a goalie coach, it, it's almost well, we're better. <laughs> right. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're better you know, than everyone else, is the point that you're trying yeah. to get at. I, I think when you're a goalie coach, it's part coach, part um, therapist, where you have to get to know the goaltender and understand the person, the personality, mm-hmm. what what drives them. You know, we talk about love languages. So you got to know what are the <laughs> love language of your goalie. What are they going to respond to? And, you know, like, like I said, there, there was the one goalie. I could just sometimes in the middle of a game when play was at the other end, give him a look like, really? And he's like, yeah, I know. You know, but then there's the other ones. Like, <laughs> don't look in their direction during a game. Don't talk to him between periods. It's, you know. But you can't do that with the greater team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's a it's a totally it's a totally different ball game coaching goaltenders. Um, I like it a lot. You know, like I, I'm a people's person. I don't get I don't get angry too easily either. And so you know, and if and at the end of the day, um, I'm not in a situation where uh, like. I'm in a situation where I'm driving individual success. I'm not driving team success. Right. Right. The team success does come from that individual success. Like, don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? Like you, you can't, just, but at the end of the day, if you've got two goalies, if one of them doesn't want to listen, like you don't necessarily have to cram it down their throats. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and you just, you just say, okay, you don't, you don't want to listen. You know, better than, you know, then do what you like. And, eventually they'll normally just kind of come back around to it as they see their goalie partner progressing or whatever the case is. And, you know, the other side of that is, uh, is, you know, I tell goalies because I want them asking questions because you get sometimes goalies in practice, especially in Toronto, there's a lot of different schools and you'll get parents that take their go- their kids to every different goalie school. So then this person's telling them this thing and this person's telling them this thing. And so what I always say to, to goalies, like my, Practically, my catchphrase is, if you think I'm an idiot, call me an idiot. Yeah. Because I don't want, because they tu- they tune us out, especially if they go to a lot of different goalie coaches. They tune us out where they go, 
oh, gee, you know, so-and-so said this, but so-and-so said that, and, you know, all right, whatever, I'll do it the way you say this time, but I'm just going to do whatever I want next time. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather them say, hey, you know what, that was the stupidest thing I ever heard, and I hate your beard, and I hate your face, and I don't want to ever talk to you again, than, than just ignore me. I'd, I'd rather that, because at least that's a conversation, yeah. but right? talk about my beard. Come on now. Well, it's glorious, obviously, but you know, the, if if that's what they want to say, I did have a kid uh, make fun of my beard actually uh, a lot, and and I like getting chirped by my goalies. It's uh, yeah, it's it's pretty funny, and you know, like I said, I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about it as long as when crunch time happens, they're willing to listen and they're willing to learn and they're willing to do the drills and 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 do what's right. Yeah, you know, I, I like that you bring up, you know, you're in an area where there's a lot of goalie schools. Um, uh, and when I was coaching, you know, I'm in the Twin Cities in Minnesota. One of my goalies was also doing uh, sessions with uh, Rob Sauber at the goal crease on the other side of town. Right. And we were in practice the one day and he goes, well, that, that's not what they're teaching me at Sauber. And I go, OK, well, what are they teaching you? So that I, I know uh, what they're teaching them. And I said, OK. I get that. I said, I want you to try this. And after you try it, tell me which one you like better. And it was interesting because he tried it. He did what I told him. And then after practice, we had like a 25, 30 minute discussion on the differences between the two and why w one will work in certain situations and the other weren't, wouldn't. He's, and, you know, now, now the uh, buzzword for goaltending is, you know, what's in your toolbox. You know, <laughs> we, we weren't using that term back then, but he, he was starting to understand that just because I'm learning one thing here doesn't mean it's the only thing I can do. Yeah. You know? And so it was, it, it, but he was one of those kids, you know, he liked talking through it and understanding it and learning it. So it, it was kind of fun to have that realization with them. Like, okay, I hear what they're teaching you. I respect what they're teaching because what they're teaching you is technically right, still, but there's more than one way to do it. You know, the, the old term, there's more than one, one way to skin the cat. Yeah, I we uh, I find that where Canada and to a lesser extent USA, but where North America is lagging behind, and and Russia is surging ahead right now, and it's so ironic because it was exactly the opposite in the eighties. Yeah. But they're not as dogmatic as us in right. terms of how they teach their goaltenders, right? And and it's it's the reason why so many of the top goalies are Russian. They're not as dogmatic. They're they don't they don't quash uh, every natural instinct that a goalie has. Yeah. And like I I always think about like it's like the Tiger Woods effect, right? Like I remember in my twenties I decided to take up golf, and uh, and I thought that I'd go take lessons, and I tried a couple you know golf schools, and they were always like. Everything you're doing is wrong. Swing the club like Tiger Woods. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, but I don't look like Tiger Woods. I'm not built like Tiger Woods. My body doesn't move like Tiger Woods. You know, I some don't people have a red polo shirt. I have several red polo shirts because I am a champion, obviously. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know, like, I, I like, it's just at the end of the day, you know what I mean? And, and so like after Tiger Woods reinvented the game, everybody was like, I'm going to just break everything that you have and make you into Tiger Woods. Right. And then, and then like Bubba Watson came in and won the masters and everybody's brains melted, you know, all of a sudden it was like, Oh, you know, you can do something else. And so, you know, like when I tell my goalies like glove positioning, for example, I'm like, be comfortable and be neutral. And what's neutral to you is not necessarily neutral to the other person. You see goalies hold their gloves way up high or way far forward. Or, you know, like you, you see a lot of extremes in this position and uh, or way out to the side or too low or whatever. I'm like, I want it natural. And, and, and within that natural element, like there's a sweet spot for you. Mm -hmm. The way that I crouch in my set crouch is not going to be the same way as the way that you set crouch in your set crouch. But... The key elements, right, is being able to move that glove into a puck for a save as quickly and easily as possible. Mm -hmm. The key elements of your set crouch is being able to be on your edges in a way that any shuffle, T-push, 
or butterfly slide or power slide you have to do from that set crouch is as easy as possible and requires as few extenuous movements as possible. So you see a lot of kids, they do the wide set crouch, right? We never taught wide set crouch at the school that I work for, the goalie school. And, and, and now all of a sudden people are going back to the narrow set crouch because but again, like it's not like there's one wide and one narrow. It's got to be right for you. But at the end of the day, your skate edges have to be planted in the ice in a certain way that they will glide if you mm -hmm. shuffle. And you don't have to completely change your, your skate angle in order to make that shuffle. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny what you're saying is, you know, there, there's just kind of like, the, this is what's got to be now. This is what's got to be now. I grew up playing goalie in the 90s. You know, you, you had... Eddie Belfour, Curtis Joseph, Felix Potvin. You always could spot the Potvin fans because they had their glove turned the wrong way. Um, right. And, and the Kuto always, fans had their glove all the way up to the side. Yeah. And, you know, as Belfour fans had a five hole you could drive a bus through. <laughs> um, but the Quebec style butterfly, the, you know, um, Patrick Waugh style was what goalie coaches were teaching at that point. Because yep. it was like, that's what Waz doing. And then you had this guy, Hashik, over here, like, don't follow what he's doing. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. Well, it turns out he knew what he was doing. It was just, he's the only guy that could play that way. Uh, but that whole Quebec style, and you started, like you said, it became dogmatic, especially for Canadian goalies. That, And if you spoke French, if you played any other way, then you, you, know, <laughs> you were really an outsider. But it was like, that was what was coming along. But I had this goalie coach... Uh, you know, in Chicago, and he was like, look, don't imitate those guys you see on TV. They can do that because they're pros. You're not pros. We're going to teach you the fundamentals. You yeah. know, how you hold your stick, this is how you do it. I mean, I, I was almost in high school at that point, and we were still doing the bare minimum basics, 90% of our goalie clinic every, every week. And, you know, as, as I look back, I was like, how much did that actually, that helped me so much. Even today in the beer leagues and back in college, it was like, that gave me such a foundation where it didn't matter what style I played or how athletic I was, because I really didn't play a style. It was more athleticism because I had that foundation is why I was good. Not because of how I reacted to the puck, but if I would have bought into that Quebec style, it wouldn't have worked for me. And, you know, the, the whole idea was good positioning and blocking. Well, I never had good positioning, so I would have been horrible if I played it. You know, I was just limber. I still am limber and quick so that I was able to make it up, make up for my bad positioning. <laughs> well, it's funny that you mentioned positioning because we harp on positioning over everything else. Like I, I think about like Jack Campbell, right? Yeah. Um, I'm not a Toronto fan, by the way. I live in Toronto, but I'm not a Toronto fan. Um, but uh, Jack Jack Campbell is kind of a great example of a goalie with excellent positioning, but yeah. an unorthodox style. And so when he makes these goofy saves, the the you know what's in your toolbox sort of thing, like when he makes these weird looking saves, it all starts with the fact that he's in the right place at the right time. Now. Then when he was having when he's struggling last year, pucks were going through him. I think that that's the rib injury, right? Like I just yeah. think like when you've when you've hurt your rib, I don't know what your injury history is, Joe, but you know, oh yeah, when you've got a cracked rib or something like that, every movement is just a, a millisecond of hesitation. And I'll I'll tell you right now that millisecond of hesitation won't get you through a beer league skate. No. Never mind, you know the NHL. But like we we kind of overthink things, right? Like I, I'll give you. A brief example, I was recently, um, I got a couple invites to some pro camps in the Fed, right? Down, you know, down your way, the, the Federal Prospects Hockey League. Yeah. You, you would, you want to be a teammate of uh, Trav? Yeah, <laughs> I saw that actually. It was, uh, I, I didn't go to the Motor City camp. Um, I was invited to, but I didn't, I didn't go to the Motor City camp. Um, but uh, one of the camps that I went to, we, we had each goalie had a period, basically, to play, right? Because um, there are several goalies at the camp. But in that period, because, of course, nobody knew each other for defense, you got, I counted between 15 and 20, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 shots every period. Yeah. So you basically got a game's worth of action in a period, right? Right. And, uh, and in the second, the, in, in one of the camps that I went to, we played three games. And in the second two games, uh, I let in zero goals for either game. 
right? Mm-hmm. And I thought that was really good. That's like, you know, 50 shots, zero goals, right? When you put those two together, that's uh, it's not a bad streak if you ask me, right? <laughs> and, I, and I went and afterwards and I, I met with the whole coaching staff and they were kind of like, they're kind of like, dude, like you can't skate. <laughs> and I was, like, I was like, look, granted, I never took lessons growing up. I didn't play junior. I said, I'm never going to look like uh, a kid that's been taking skating lessons since he was six years old. Right. But that's not, but I'm always so far ahead of the play. I'm always reading the play and that's what we're teaching. Right. And that positioning and reading the play that it's kind of like, okay, so your T push was a little sloppy. Yeah. Your break was a little whatever, but you know, that, that positioning, like it, it covers just a multitude of sins as a goaltender mm-hmm. yeah. being, we're not talking within two inches. We're talking within a half an inch of where you've got to stand yeah. every single time and knowing your net, you know what I mean? That just, it's uh, you know, Mike Richter's quote, right? Yeah. People yep. go crazy about the big save half the time. It was because the goalie made a mistake position. Yeah. Right. In the first place. And, and Mike Richter was pretty good as I recall. Yeah. And he made a <laughs> lot of those big saves too. So it's like, yeah, he, he knew what he was talking about. Cause he was telling himself I was out of position for those. And that's exactly what my goalie coach in youth hockey told me, told all of us. He's like, if, if you're making the big save, it's because you are out of position. I want to see the simple saves. Uh, I want to see more simple saves. I don't want to see the big saves. And he would every now and then show up to somebody's game and, you know, he would comment on how many simple saves you made because uh, there's something really to that. And that was back in the day when the coaches were tying skate laces to the corners to teach you, you know, yeah. positioning. I don't know if yeah. you've seen the video that uh, fellow Toronto guy Steve McKeegan has out talking about box control and he just kind of has a projector and has yeah. the goalie and you turn around it's like wow yeah i just moved it this much and i take up that much more net wow uh that, that really drives it home i think for some goalies when they see it visually like that the head coach at uh, the goalie school uh Dwayne crocker i i met him because i started taking lessons and uh for the first time in my life and and i wanted to you know see if there was something there and uh, he, at one point, brought an iPad out on the ice mm-hmm. and put the iPad where the puck is and was like, treat the iPad like a puck, then turns on the selfie camera. And it was just amazing how just like, just a, a little, just you move your shoulder half an inch. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, that whole top shelf side is gone. And that's how he taught kind of the idea of getting into a shoulder save compared to a blocker save and, and stuff like that. It's... um. So it's a similar, it's a similar, uh, uh, concept, yeah. you know, for teaching that. But I mean, like, why was Jack Nicholas the greatest golfer of all time? Uh, you know what? I'm not a golfer, so I don't know. I've heard, I've heard, this is like a quote and I can't remember who said it, but I use this quote all the time. So it's pathetic that I don't know who said it, but Nicholas was not the best golfer of all time because he hit the most Eagles and he wasn't the best golfer of all time because he hit the most birdies. He was the best golfer of all all time because he hit the most pars. He always maintained consistency. Mm -hmm. He didn't bogey. He didn't double. I mean, obviously he did because he had a long career that spanned into like his mid seventies. But like the his baseline was so good, right? And he never let things get out of control. And and that to me, it's the hardest part of goaltending is maintaining consistency right? It's the number one hardest part of goaltending. And the best way to maintain that consistency is, you know, is like you said, the simple saves, right? You've got to make Mm -hmm. all of those saves. If you, yeah, I remember Paul Campbell uh, from in goal telling me once that he was looking at the stats from clear sight analytics. And um, he was saying like the stats for when you let in like a bad goal of like less than point something expected goals for whatever it was. Right. He's like, your, your ability to outperform that bad goal is virtually non-existent. You could, you could stand on your head all night and, and you have still a very small chance of winning the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. I mean, as we get older and start playing beer league, it just becomes compounded. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's crazy. And, uh, it, it was funny because my last game, we, we had a buy this week, but my last game, I saw 40 shots. And I'm like, all right, I feel good about myself. Yeah. 
problem is I saw 50 shots and I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, but I, I'm one of those beer leaders. I put the GoPro up behind the net and, um, what, what I did feel good about is I, I, the GoPro, uh, battery died before the game ended, but I, I have the, uh, uh, what is it? The Brian Decord stop at game day app where it tells yeah. you the expected goals against and so, past couple games have been like right on. It's like, all right, I, I let in 10, but because of the situations, you know, the, the odd man rushes, the defense I'm getting, it's like, okay, I have to feel good about myself. I don't know if you ever listened to the, um, uh, goalie by Garmin podcast or short 10 minute clips when he was on his way to the break. And, and one of them really hit me home and I wish I would have heard it a lot earlier in my career, like maybe my freshman year when I was just getting shelled. Um, and it's focus on what you can control, not not what you can't, because uh-huh. you can't control the team in front of you. You can't control your opponent, but you can control things like we've been talking about, your movement, your positioning, your attitude after a goal. Those are the things you can control. And once I heard that, it really, it was kind of that aha moment, and it changed the way I look at games, whether I played a good game. Obviously, I played well, but you know what? Maybe we won five to one. How did that goal go in? Yeah. I have controlled it. But then at the same time, games like the last one where I let in 10, I'm like, okay, what could I control in those situations? Um, And it it just so happened to be, you know, I I knew some of the guys on the other team and they're like, yeah, you didn't get much help out there, did you? (laughs) It's like, no, but I still have a smile on my face because I felt good about the way I played. And that that becomes a big thing, I think, that – Young goalies aren't necessarily taught. They're they're overlooking that at times. At some of these goalie schools of you know, what are you thinking after the game of your performance, and how honest are you about it? Because um, there there were times maybe I wasn't as honest with myself as I should have been with how bad it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, he, here's the thing, right? Is that it's the hardest thing with goaltending is balancing results-based analysis with um, true analysis, mm-hmm. right? I'll yeah. give you an example. I'm, I'm not a basketball guy at all, but Same. my brother's a basketball guy. And so we went to a game for Raptors 905, which is the farm team for the Raptors, and they're playing Boston's farm team. And, and a friend told me to buy tickets to that game and because – the big prospect was there. And when I say big, I mean, literally ta- uh, his name's taco fall or something like that. He's like seven foot four. Right. Mm-hmm. And everybody's all excited to see this guy. And I was like, wow, this is going to be kind of cool to see this guy in person. And it was very cool to see the guy in person. But I turned to my brother and I was like, is it just me or does he suck? And this is years ago before he cracked the NBA. And now kind of people know that he sucks, but and it wasn't because I'm, I know anything about basketball. I know nothing about basketball. Right. All I know is that a seven foot two guy stood underneath the net about 15 times and didn't come up with a single rebound. (laughs) And so that's results-based analysis, right? Right. All I know is that this goalie has, and I'm going to say that the, the hated stat, all I know is that this goalie has a five goals against average. Right. Right. And so now people hate goals against average. I hate it. I don't want to hear it. That's not a goalie stat. That's a team stat. And, to an extent, I agree. But if you consistently on different teams always have a high goals against average, sooner or later, you know, what are you doing here? Yeah. Right? So we have to control that results-based analysis with, you know, you look at, like, how, how many goalies have we seen come through the NHL that have every tool to succeed? They're the best skaters. They're great positionally. And yet... They can't seem to get their head around stopping that one shot, that one extra yeah. shot, that whatever that might be, whatever that might look like for, for those goalies. The, the bottom line is, is that, you know, some goalies we get excited to see because of how they move, how they skate, how they stand, what they do. And yet they never, they can't hack it in the NHL. Well, it's, it's the, it's the Derek Jeter argument. You know, I, I think it was some MIT kids did an analysis of his play. And some argue he's one of the greatest shortstops of all time and multiple championships and everything else. But statistically, he was an average to below average shortstop. But when it mattered, 
he was exceedingly far above average. When it right. mattered, that's what, you know, that's when he really performed. He, he made plays nobody would have ever thought of. I mean, that iconic play where he's on the first baseline with the flip to get the tag at the plate, there's no reason a shortstop should be there. But that's what made him great. That, that's what made an average shortstop great. Yeah, I mean, like you're you're talking about the ability to be a gamer. Yeah, and in a sense, that's sort of what I'm talking about as well, right? Right? Like you, you know, uh, I, you're you're in Minnesota. You've got lots of great hockey around you. There are so many rinks in and around Toronto. I maybe have played at a hundred different rinks, and yet this week alone, I went to two rinks that I've never been to before in my life. There are so many rinks in this city; it's outrageous. So there, needless to say, there's a lot of hockey happening around here. And the reality is, is that every, any U15 or U16 single A team, the goalie looks like a great goalie. Right. He skates well. He moves well. Or, or, or she skates well or she moves well. Any, any rep level goalie looks good. And so what separates, you know, uh, a, a low rep level from a high rep level. And certainly there's a certain amount of, you know, really being, you know, more on top of your positioning, more on top of these things. Leg recovery is a huge one, right? Um, mm -hmm. Tracking rebound control behind the net, you know, little things that, uh, you know, basically you will just never stop working on throughout your entire goaltending career because there's simply no, no physical way to have mastered that. No. Certainly a lot of that is that, but there's also a lot of it where it's just like, you know, where were you at the moment when the lights were the brightest, mm -hmm. right? And and so I agree with you that there is a certain a certain gamer uh, aspect to this to this position because ultimately you might see one breakaway in two games. And if you let a, a really easy breakaway in and you look like a putz, then you've got two games of feeling that feeling that before you can face that one more time yeah yeah right it's, it's funny it, i mean that's I, I credit my college coach to ending every practice with a shootout so <laughs> i got you know 20 years after college i still have extreme confidence when i get a breakaway i'm like all right <laughs> here we go I, i've got this and you know yeah. i would say nine out of ten times i stop that breakaway yeah um, you know and I, I'm ready for that shot if they're coming straight on. But if I I know if in the beer leagues now, if they're coming from either corner, they're going to try and deke and slide across. And, you know, so I've, I've got the active stick when they're in close, but I still really, <laughs> I re, especially if they're coming from my glove side, there's two things that happen if they're coming from my glove side. If they're coming in real tight, I do this pad stack and then stick the, uh, paddle out so they're either going to go tumbling over me or i i get the poke check and it's good it doesn't go in the net or i do the split save i thank god i can still do that and it works every single time it's it's crazy and you know we play the same teams year after year they know my moves and they still fall for it <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny i've never been able to do a split save but uh i did over the summer, you know, I was going to a lot of different uh, camps and mm -hmm. and things. You know, friends of mine that are trainers that were training off season pro kids and and stuff yeah. like that. And I'd go and sit in the net just to feel the shots and you know have some fun with it. But uh, anyways, this uh, this kid from the USHL was coming down on a breakaway in in one of the camps, and I just I don't know what went on in my brain. I just went for a big pad stack. And saw that he was going high as I was stacking it. And like, this is like a pure pad stack. This isn't like a lateral yeah. movement. This is like a, I should butterfly here, but I'm going to stack them instead. Right. Yep. And so he shot high and I just nicked it with the top of my stick, nicks the stick, nicks the top of the crossbar and goes over. And his, his just jaw dropped. He's like eight, 17 or 18 years old. Like, you know, he hasn't seen this in ever, yeah. right? And uh, and I just was like, oh, I'm so glad I got that. And and then it it, it struck me as something, it, it, an idea struck me when I did that. And then the next day when I was coaching, I decided to coach pad stacks. Mm -hmm. And so the, the kids show up at the arena. They're both 
16 great goalies. I love coaching these two. They're so much fun. Um, totally different personalities. Uh, but uh, they show up and I say, okay, we're working on pad stacks today. And the guy, one of the guys laughs. One of the guys just laughs in my face. He goes, yeah, okay, sure. I said, you think I'm joking? We're working on pad stacks today. And he's like, he's like, are you serious? And, and he's been with the school. He's been teach, uh, uh, learning from the school longer than I've been working for the school. He's like, I'm calling Coach Dwayne. I'm going to see if this is real. I said, you can call Coach Dwayne if you like. I'm teaching you pad stacks today. Right? Oh, and what, what occurred to me in it is that a pad stack breaks down reading a shot to its most simple forms. Is the shot yeah. going left or is the shot going right? Is the shot going high or is the shot going low? And it's as mm-hmm. simple as that. Left, stack left. Left high, stack left, lift the leg. And it got them, uh, because both of them were struggling with kind of being a little bit in their own head, a little bit hesitant with every move, a little bit, you know what I, you, you know what I mean? And uh, so that was the last practice for one of them before he was going to, I'm going to get this pronunciation. I think it's the Makavia Games which is like a, a, a Jewish Olympic sort of thing that they had in San Diego. And his, his last practice before going to this in San Diego, and he was supposed to be going as the backup goalie. And he went in and, uh, and he just stood on his head from the first practice and split starts with the goalie. He was, they told him that he was only going to get one or two starts. He went in split starts. And I think that part of it, Obviously, there's no substitution for the years of work that he's put in. But part of it is that he just walked in loose. Yeah. You know? Now, two things with the pad stack. I don't know if you follow uh, Bonesy, the uh, Nashville e-bug, but we, we've kind of become friends. And he, he has an old 1970s uh, setup that he brings out every so often just for filming and whatnot. And he, I told him, we got to get on the ice together. And I need to teach him proper two pad stack but more importantly <laughs> the two pad stack recovery because most goalies just roll out on their belly do the push-up i'm old enough that when i went to goalie schools we learned how to two pad stack as well as skate save where you turned the whole skate over and exposed the whole back side of your leg yeah like, bonesy we need to get on the ice and i need to give you a proper 80s style goalie clinic He's like, i love it <laughs> but yeah. um you talk stacking the pads on younger kids. I showed up to a summer league game. It was probably about three years now. I got, I still to this day get to the rink an hour before my games. Yeah, me too. It's just, and so I, I get there summer uh, practice for a high school team and only one of their goalies showed up and the coach is walking out. He sees my bag. He's like, Hey, if you want some extra shots, you know, we could use you. It's like, <laughs> All right. I said, sure, but I'm not doing any skating. And he's like, I wouldn't expect you to. <laughs> you know, so it, it was one thing I miss from like competitive hockey is actually practice. So it actually kind of yeah. good into work on some stuff while well, they're scrimmaging at the end. And there's a, I just see it coming down. It's two on one. They're coming from puck carriers on my glove side. And I can see the kid over here, uh, my peripheral and he passes it across and I stack the pads. Puck hits me in the pad stops right there. And if the kid would have just kept going, he could have put it up and over me, but he yeah. just, stops and puts his arms up and looks at the coach. He's like, what is that? I've never <laughs> seen that before. Yeah, <laughs> It was like, because they don't teach that anymore. Kids don't do it. And I, I understand why, but to your point, like have fun, teach it. And then it's to what we said before. It's just another tool in the toolbox. Um, it's yeah, I have no expectation of them. I have no expectation of them doing it. I, and, and, and as a matter of fact, like, in a desperation situation, you just do whatever you can, mm-hmm. you know, in a desperation yeah. situation, maybe your momentum's going the wrong way and the defender tried to clear the puck. So let's say your upper body momentum is going to your right. Defender tried to clear the mm-hmm. puck, but it hit a skate. Now the puck's going to your left and your upper body's going to your right. Maybe you just think, well, then I throw my legs left and see what happens because yeah. I can't catch my upper body momentum. Like there, there's a situation that that's unique enough that you might use it. That situation mm-hmm. might arise once every two years. Yeah. Well, so, I, I, I pull this pad sack out four or five times a season, you know, that might be a bit. Much. Much I, <laughs> my age, it works, you know, right. it, it fits with, but to, for somebody who was brought up learning it, and that's as much as I use it, you're right. You know, it's know it, 
know how to do it, and then you're good. So I, I, I see we've been talking for almost 40 minutes here, and I haven't even gotten to my questions. So okay. the, the, the first one is, you know, yeah, you're in Toronto, but how, how did you get started in the game of hockey? Well, it starts from living in Toronto. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a actually, it's, it, it was, it's a birthright. Exactly. That's why I lose everywhere I go as well. <laughs> actually, it's um, my dad had no interest in sports whatsoever. Mm-hmm. I always laugh. I'm like the one kid in the world. Like, like it's just the exact opposite of every other, every kid that wants to do music or band or jazz or something like that. Their parents push them into sports. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to do sports, but my dad was into like musical theater. So like, I, you know, I, I can sing to you almost every show tune in the book, you know, (laughs) I, I can I can do Officer Krupke. I can do, you know, all this stuff. But I wanted to do hockey, right? Mm-hmm. And and my dad wasn't keen on it. So um, when, uh, when my parents split up around 13 or so, um, my, my mom was more keen on hockey. And it was kind of a, okay, well, you're going through a rough time. What do you want to do? And I was like... I, I, I forget just hockey. It's like hockey, football, boxing, everything. <laughs> she drew the line at boxing. She's like, you know, you're a few brain cells away from, you know, we, we should just keep as many as we can. Yeah. But, you know, next thing you know, I'm, I'm hockey, football, varsity, football, varsity, rugby, you know, all the rest of it. And, uh, you know, it just, Obviously, hockey night in Canada was is just such a huge part of my childhood. Mm-hmm. You know, my brother made a little rink in our backyard, but we've got Toronto real estate, so <laughs> the backyard, like the rink, was literally like twelve by twelve. <laughs> so uh, a lot of battle drills in the backyard with uh, with my older my oldest brother, who's fifteen years older than me, David. Um, you know, I credit him a lot uh, for this, but you know eventually hockey is an expensive sport and, and, yeah. and sort of, we just got, we, I got priced out of going further and, uh, and that was sort of, that always stuck with me. And, and then, you know, in my mid twenties, I just, I just thought I'm going to get into the sport somehow, mm-hmm. you know, and that, you know, coaching, learning, teaching, and, you know, shoot, I got, you know, like pro camp, whatever's, you know, and, and I'm, playing around the city like i was i was out with some friends playing and then uh and then the oshawa generals ohl team came over and was like hey can we use you for some scrimmage mm-hmm. yeah gee let me think <laughs> well that i was in college it was summer between my junior and senior year i was home in chicago interning at abc news uh and what was great is guys interning with we met playing pickup hockey at the one rink right by the united center um and we typically work evenings, so I could go to the lunchtime pickup hockey and then right. take, take a shower. And what was nice is my dad was working. Um, he was a Chicago fireman, and he was working in the office of the emergency management at the time, and their offices were across the street. So I would drive down, play hockey, throw my hockey bag in his car so he could take it home, <laughs> and then head, you know, shower up, head downtown, and do my internship. Well, it was about... Uh, Maybe your dad time. must have loved you so much to let you throw your stinky, sweaty, smelly, still wet pads into his car to oh, yeah. sit there. Yeah, well, in the summertime, nonetheless, and so sitting. Oh in yeah, in the sun, just baking. But nonetheless, what he what he did love is that I was skating over his lunch hour, and he would walk across the street and watch me skate. And th- this comes in handy because it was about the second week that Billy Zito, he's now the um, GM of Florida. He was a player rep at the time and he would skate, skate with us. But some of his guys started coming out to open skate or, you know, pick up hockey with us. But we had one guy, you know, he, he was a carpenter and he was missing, you know, the, these three fingers. So it's not like he was a good stick handle or a shot. We had Father yeah. Murray, a 72 year old retired Navy chaplain out there with us. So, you know, <laughs> Billy's guys that were playing in the NHL and the AHL, they weren't getting much, um, out of those skates. So they got the uh, ice time ahead of Brad hockey and I'm coming off the ice, you know, the next week and uh, Brad Norton comes up to me. He's like, Hey, do you want to come early tomorrow and skate with us? We need a goalie. I was like, uh, yeah. 
And so <laughs> the rest of the summer, I'm skating with those guys. And it was it was great going into my senior year. Like I, I never was more prepared for a tryout than that year. Yeah. But it was just so cool to have dad walk across the street at lunchtime and see me on the ice with these guys. And I'll never forget that feeling. I was down at the one end. Brad Nor or uh, Joe Corvo, who played, you know, uh, he played in a couple of teams, but he played in the Stanley Cup finals and everything. He's coming down on a breakaway, and these guys are competitive. So he's just looking to light up this college kid. And he makes a move. I pull out the split save, and uh, I just stop him. The, the Both benches erupt. He's hitting his stick against the board because he's so pissed off. And I just look <laughs> up at my dad and the smile on his face. You know, it, it was just, it was one of those moments. It's like, all right, this is pretty cool. doesn't matter if I go any further in the game, and I didn't, but it was like, I can say I stopped an NHL breakaway, and my dad was there to see it, you know. Those are the special, special memories, eh? Yeah, and it was that same yeah. skate that uh, Steve Martin, he kind of bounced up and down. Um, he's chasing uh, Rob Brown, who won a cup in Pittsburgh. He's chasing him, back-checking on a breakaway, well, he gets Brownie right before he gets the shot off, and Brownie just loses his edge. Me, Brownie, the puck, go into the net and slide all the way back to the boards. And he's on top of me, giving me a bear hug, just laughing. And finally, <laughs> like, the dust settles. He's like, are you okay? I was like, yeah, but are you okay? Because you can't stop laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was, it was the same skate. It, it, it was pretty fun, though. Um, yeah. But so you get into hockey, you know, for the obvious reason. You're born in Toronto. Mom finally lets you play. And then you get back into it later on. What drew you between the pipes? Um, I'm an idiot, you know, <laughs> is, the, is the honest truth here. Like, I, I you know, I, you've watched like Wayne's World, right? Oh, God, yeah. 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 Mike Myers grew up in Scarborough. Yeah. I grew up in Scarborough. I live in Scarborough. I'm a lifelong Scarborough boy. I went to to school with Wayne Simmons and Tyler Toffoli. You know, it's this. This is so the whole you know car game on. That was Mike Myers telling the story about growing up in Scarborough, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I remember, you know, when you're a little little kid, everybody wants to be the goalie when you're a little kid, right? it's the cool pads It's the cool yeah. position in road hockey or floor hockey in school or whatever the case is, but everybody wants to be the goalie. And at some point or another, everybody stopped wanting to be the goalie, but nobody told me that we'd all stopped wanting to be the goalie. <laughs> and I was just like, I get to be goalie again. This is great. <laughs> and so, you know, I just, just coming up playing ball hockey. And then when I finally got led onto ice hockey, it's like, you know, it's kind of like the old, you know, the Mighty Ducks was coming out at the time and stuff like that where Goldberg couldn't skate. And it's just like, I'd never even really skated before. And it's like, wow, geez, I wonder what position I'll pick. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, so, you know, you become a goalie. You had to have been in a, a hit in the locker room being a show tune singing goalie. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, there, there are aspects of myself that I might not have divulged to a bunch of testosterone-driven 15-year-olds. <laughs> at least now in, the beer league, now in the beer leagues, you can let the show tunes fly. And oh, play. it's hilarious. I, yeah, I, uh, I, I, my mouth never stops working. when yeah. uh, It's the hardest working aspect of me when I'm on the ice, that's for sure. I think of Nick the goalie who I'm working on getting on the podcast. Uh, you know, he's the one that has the videos where he's just talking. Yeah, about yeah. yeah. I, I could see you mic'd up uh, just singing the show go to throughout the game. <laughs> well, you, you know what? For the longest time, and every goalie has a has a trick to, to calm themselves. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, it actually was show to. And so a guy's coming down on a breakaway, and here I am, you know. It's just a bringing up key that gets us out of hand. Our mother's all our junkies. Our father's all our junks. Golly, Moses, glove save. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and it was. It was show tunes that, that I used for a while. Uh, then it became uh, an Emo Phillips joke. I don't know if you know the Emo Phillips comedian. Yeah. Um, I would use the joke uh, that it's just like my favorite joke of all time. My principal said, Emo, I could expel you. And I said, you'd have to catch and eat me first, you weirdo. 
<laughs> and so that was like my reset. If I let in a goal, I'd kind of, you know, like almost like Rain Man repeating who's on first. Like I'd kind of repeat yeah. that to myself and, you know, it would kind of calm me. So no, I've, it, and, and a friend of mine actually funny enough, sent me a video of Nick, the goalie and said, this is how I picture you being. And I was like, yeah, I definitely, I've not uh, interacted with Nick at all, but, uh, I feel it. <laughs> yeah, you, you, your kindred spirits. It's funny, when I was a kid, I would sing, you know, when play was at the other end during um, stoppage and play. In fact, when I was in high school, we had um, Gary Presley, the Chicago Cubs organist, would play at our home games. So, you know, between periods, I'd just kind of be sitting there bouncing to the, the organ music. Um, but as I got older, that, that kind of left me. And I, I don't know why. Um, because you're not allowed to have personality in hockey. Don't have oh, a personality. Oh, no. I, I've, I've always had it. In fact, my <laughs> uh, coach, my freshman and sophomore year of high school, was actually, he's now a, a therapist, a doctor in psychology. So he, he nurtured that personality in me by no means. <laughs> That's good. Um, but uh, I, I guess in college, I didn't play that much. So it was more just focusing on opening, closing the door. So I don't have to worry about staying calm <laughs> during games. In fact, I usually had extra sandwiches in my hockey pants that I could sneak and eat during the games. Um, <laughs> but as I got into the beer leagues, um, I started counting shots. Yeah. That, that calmed my mind. I wasn't focusing on what could go wrong. It was just like, okay, there's one shot. There's two shots. Yeah. There's three shots. Um, part, part of me wishes it, it would go back to the, the music or something else. But I think part of it is I just don't know full songs anymore. <laughs> there is. who needs to know a full song like nobody's yeah. listening to you sing like i i uh i had a joke once with my wife we were on a motorcycle trip and we had the little intercom yeah. system. and i forget what song it was but i told her that i knew every word to some song and we're we've been on the bike for hours right and she's like okay sing it right we're talking through the intercom yeah and i <laughs> i didn't know a single word to the song but I just made sure that there's enough wind blowing into the intercom that it just sort of sounded like I did. Yeah. It was like, and, and at the end of it, she goes, wow, I'm impressed. You did know every word. And I said, I didn't say a single word in the English language <laughs> the whole time. So my point is nobody's listening to you. It doesn't matter. You know, right. I only know the first verse of Chattanooga Choo Choo, but I'll <laughs> sing that all the time on the ice, you know, Hey there boy. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's, you know, you really do. You, you, it's a game for crying out loud, yeah. you know. And, you know, I've, I've talked to hockey mindset people and, and Pete Fry is a fantastic dude yep. uh, who I talk to. But what I kind of always come back to is just find your neutral. What's your what's your neutral? What's your default setting? Yeah. Right. And this is like what you see now is sort of my default setting. And so if I go to a rink and I try to be too serious or I try to be whatever, I, I don't play well. I got to go to a rink and be a little cocky, even if I don't feel it. And, and I never do, by the way. That's my secret. Right? I never have once stepped on the ice feeling confident about myself. No, but you have to outwardly show that. And of course, it, yeah. Yeah, it, it's funny because uh, if, if I were to sing, it would be like that um, scene from Canadian Bacon where they're trying to sing uh, Born in the <laughs> Born USA. in the USA. Yeah. yeah. It's totally me. But this summer, my, my nieces were in town, and we were going up to the cabin with them and my kids. And it was almost uh, carpool karaoke where, you know, we had the GoPro on the front dash, so you could see the whole <laughs> car. And my yeah. wife was, you know, singing along the songs. The kids were in the back. And then I was like, we need to play Bohemian Rhapsody because of Wayne's World. <laughs> um, and, like, That's it, an ambitious one. Yeah. I would not try it. Well, if the song's playing, I can sing along to the whole song. But off yeah. the top of my head, not a chance. But it was funny because like, I just start going and my wife's like, I can see why you picked this song. But I was really disappointed in all the kids when none of them started headbanging at the appropriate time. It's like, come on. you know. Yeah. The nieces are from Chicago. They should know. Uh, you know, my kids have watched Wayne's World with me. I do that all the time whenever it's on. It's like none of you, not one of you could have helped me out here. But it, it was funny that, that that was the one song they're like, huh? The one song I do know all the words to, though, is Take Me Out to the Ball Game. So, you know, when my kids were little and I'd be rocking them to sleep and everything, 
that was the lullaby that I knew for them was take me out to the ball game. And it was funny because my daughter just told me this story. Uh, it was like second or third grade. They're in music class and they're learning to sing, take me out to the ball game. Well, she knew it. And it comes to the part root root. Well, I'm a diehard Cubs fan for my youth. And I always sang it root root for the Cubs and her try teaching her it's root root for the home team. And she's like, that's not how it goes. It's root root for the cubbies. And like she had this little, you know, as a second grader, had this argument with the teacher of what the actual words were. She's like, no, that's how my dad sang it. That's how the song goes. Don't you understand that my dad is the arbiter of all that is good and right in the world? Have you not yeah. gotten that memo? But but I said, you know, if one thing you made that teacher's day with that argument of like, no, oh, yeah. that's it, you know, it was like and she just told me this like four or five weeks ago. It was like, you're 15 now and you're telling me this story from your second grade. <laughs> like, why did I not know this sooner? But it was just so funny. Yeah. I, she's like, I had like a 10 minute argument with my teacher. I'm like, no, you're wrong. Those are not the words. This is how my dad sing, sings. Yeah. Um, so I want to be mindful of time because I have a feeling we could talk all night. And I mean, you were on the ice. You probably want to get home to your wife and, but, uh, but, yes, uh, my phone's also at 17% now. Yeah, <laughs> and I mean, um, we haven't even talked about the podcasts you have. So real quick, what podcasts do you have so we can get people listening to that as well? Yeah, so uh, Ken Campbell, um, legendary hockey writer, mm -hmm. uh, has written for the Hockey News and the Toronto Star, and he now has a Substack Hockey Unfiltered. And the podcast is also called Hockey Unfiltered. We tend to look at a few different teams or a few different storylines every week. And um, he's just uh, – that guy is just a ball of energy. He, mm -hmm. he really is. Like, I, I've, I've never been considered the strong, silent one. <laughs> but put me in a room with Ken Campbell and I'm the strong, silent one. Um, and he's, he's super uh, – yeah, he's just really energetic, really entertaining. I, you know, he's one of the few people that I know within the mainstream media sphere that's really, really unafraid to just sort of say it like it is. Mm -hmm. We've had awesome guests on. We've had Elliot Friedman. We've had Jeff Merrick. We've had uh, Bob McKenzie. We've had, um, oh, geez, who else have we had? Oh, we had Don Waddell on, right? The GM mm -hmm. for... Uh, uh, and we had uh, Bill Armstrong was on. Oh, Bill Armstrong was hilarious. First thing Ken says to Bill Armstrong. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was weird. First thing I'm in my car and I guess the radio just turned on. First Maybe. thing, first thing Ken says to Bill Armstrong is Bill, you look great. You look like you still can't play hockey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. And that was on draft, uh, not draft. That was, that was on free agent day or draft day no that was draft day we had bill armstrong at the end of draft day come on to the podcast mm -hmm. and uh mm -hmm. and immediately gets made fun of by Kevin. <laughs> that's awesome so we we, so, got people, we got the plug for the podcast in and i apologize we should have talked more about that but you know this is what happens when goalies talk we get sidetracked oh yeah um but I don't know if you've listened to any or many of the podcast episodes of Tendy Talk, but I close out every episode with the same 10 questions for every goalie. So I've had Bantam goalies on, I've had uh, women's Olympic gold medalists on, and I've had NHL goalies on that have, are in the Hall of Fame. They've all answered yeah. the same questions. And the first one is, what's the craziest coaching moment from your days in the game where a coach just lost it? Oh boy, my craziest coaching moment where a coach just lost it. I don't really have many, if truth be told, at least not from hockey. But uh, Toronto, I'd say there's, actually, there's got to be a few. I, I've heard about those Toronto coaches. Uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, if they can get pretty intense. Actually, I, I've I've seen a couple from from coaching alongside other coaches but i'll tell you the craziest one was uh was at down at the in, when i was trying out for the fed a few weeks ago uh, a few months ago i should say um the first skate it was just some drills 
like everybody misunderstood the drill. And the coach, who was actually a pretty nice guy, I liked him a lot, was basically like gathered everybody around and is like, if you're not going to listen to what the drill is, then professional hockey is not for you. <laughs> and if you do it wrong again, I'm sending you home right now. <laughs> <laughs> and and at another skate, the goalie coach is a similar thing where, you know, when goalies, that terrible habit that a lot of goalies have where they do that double C cut out to the top of their crease. Yep. The goalie coach before running the goalie session said, first time that I see anybody move out to the top of their crease like this, they're out of here. They're done. They're not coming back. And uh, fortunately, because I do, I coach, I, I spent a lot of time getting that habit out of my game because I, I'm always getting that habit out of, out of other people's games. But yeah. uh, I, it's not crazy like in the sense of a coach reaming somebody out. It was more crazy in the sense of... Uh, in the sense of, you know, just like, whoa, this guy's like not playing around. I guess my, my craziest coaching situation was I got, I got reamed out for breaking my hand in football. <laughs> when I was playing varsity football, uh, I, I tried to do a block, a cut block. And it was a freak accident. You know, uh, one of the tackles jumped up uh, for, and we were trying to get a field goal and he landed. He was wearing rugby cleats, lands on my hand. My hand balloons up. Coach says, and I, I walk out off the field, my hand's like the size of, you know, it's double the size. And the coach is like, get back out there. I got back out there because, you know, football, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, immediately, um, while making a tackle, took a helmet to that same hand, vomited on the field in so much pain, and then got off the, the field. Next day, uh, I missed practice going to the doctor's. And then the day after that, the coach is like, you're off the team for missing practice. And I was like, I went to the doctors for a broken hand. Like, what? Yeah. What? And he's like, you should have been there to at least learn the drills and, and learn the plays. And I was like, I went to the doctors for a broken hand. So the team that won the city championship the year before, he did that to me and he did that to like two other guys. And basically the whole backfield because i was fullback the running back he did that too and the other fullback he did that too as well the second string fullback uh but we often played in wishbone formation the whole backfield was gone and they got eliminated in the first round of the playoffs that year well <laughs> you took a championship team and ruined it you know if i'm the coach i'm just gonna tell you you should have drank more milk it was your fault to begin with <laughs> it wasn't my fault to begin with obviously yeah, yeah. Of yeah. course. <laughs> so, so the next question, what's your favorite all-time goalie mask? Oh, I do have a favorite all-time goalie mask, and it's not even close. But I'm a Montreal fan. Die hard Montreal fan. Mom and dad from Montreal. I I always joke when people in Toronto are like, why aren't you a Leafs fan? I'm like, what goalies do I have to watch in my lifetime that are Leafs? You know, anyways, so it kills me to say this one, but it is Jerry Cheevers. It, it's a good one. And if, if I took the time it's to go story. Yeah. If, if I went back and ranked, you know, wh what everybody has said, his is top of the list of what all the it's, boys talked about. Why is there an argument there, that should be the answer for every single person? And it's the story. Right. It's the story. The fact that. He he said, I'm going to wear a mask. And, and when the puck hit him in the face a second time that game, the trainer drew a scar on it. Yeah. And then the next shot to the face, the trainer drew a scar on it. That's It's the story. And so Jacques Plante is the reason it was the first goalie, as we know, to wear a mask in a game, right? Mm -hmm. Jerry Cheevers is the guy that normalized it, in yeah. my mind, right? And, and, and left a very physical testimony to the importance of the mask in the game. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it drove home the point of why they were putting the mask on. Well, I, I've told the story before, you know, I, I've had teammates ask me, well, what would you have done if you played in the era when goalies didn't wear masks? And I just looked at him and was like, I would have been a forward. Like I may yeah. be a goalie, but I'm not dumb. <laughs> yeah. I would have still been a goalie. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next question is, what's your favorite rink that you've played at? Um, you know, you know what it is? 
it's a tie. It's Ted Reeves is my local is sort of one of my local rinks, and uh, they shot a lot of movies there. It's actually getting torn down soon and built into a larger uh, arena complex. But um, Ted Reeves, I think that they shot uh, Face Off there, and they they've shot a lot of hockey movies at that arena. Got a lot of character. As soon as I walk in, like I could be blindfolded, you could walk me into that arena. I know the smell. Yep. But, a great, great barn to play in was Rico Coliseum. That play, and I think it's Coca Cola Center. It's where the Marlies used to play, or the Marlies do play, I should say. Um, the ice is impeccable. The ice is better than the Leafs practice facility, which I go to often. The ice is impeccable, and the atmosphere and and watching games there is fantastic. And it's an old, old building. I love it. Rico Coliseum, it would be tied. That's awesome. It's funny that, you know, the first one, most of the goalies, there's some emotional connection. I think every single one of them, like you said, could close your eyes and they could just, they can smell that rink, even if they're not there. They, they know that. Now, is that a good smell or a bad smell? <laughs> That, that, that's a philosophical question. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's the black mold that's only native to the my home arena. It, it, it's a bad smell that brings up good memories. So therefore, oh, there you it's go. a good smell. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah. So what's your favorite stick that you've used? I still use Sherwood 530s. Okay. I'm a um, fellow wood stick guy. I, well, foam core guy. I'm still holding out. I don't like the composites. Eventually, I'm going to have to use them, but I just, I like the heavier wooden foam core sticks. How the heck else are you going to break somebody's Achilles tendon? Yeah. Well, and... Obviously. I mean, that ends the argument right there. I, I think everybody <laughs> should go back to wood sticks. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's your favorite? I say that I've let in like one or two goals because my blocker was just a little slow. Yeah. But it's like it's it's not like a straight shot to the blocker. It's like I'm down and the puck's flipping over me and I try to get my blocker up there. Like it's always a freak situation when I let in a, a shot that I can kind of blame on the wood stick. But I, I like the way that it feels a lot better. And I I say that it does more good than bad for me. And I've tried composite several times, but I just always go back to the Marty Broder Sherwood 530s. Yeah. So the last stick I got was actually a Colin Delia uh, Pro Return Warrior. And I, it, it's interesting because oh, yeah. it's a much shorter paddle than I'm used to, but I wanted to try it because the thing now is the shorter paddle for when you're down. I'm like, well, I'm kind of down often, so that makes sense. But as a trigger grip, I'm never going back. Oh, yeah. I love the trigger grip. Uh, I'm a convert. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, when that stick breaks, I'm keeping that stick as my template so I can just put the router in there with the flush bit and uh, cut it in yeah. my next stick if it's not on it. Perfect. Uh, so the next question, what's your favorite youth hockey memory? I'd say my favorite youth hockey memory is uh, it's um, going to – Roger Nelson had a camp here. Mm-hmm close to Toronto in a, in a smaller town called Lindsay, Ontario, which is about an hour and a half outside of the greater Toronto area. And, um, I, you know, I couldn't, like, I couldn't skate when I started playing and this was one of, you know, we, we really tried, we, we tried, you know, and, and unfortunately it just, it just got too financially cumbersome. But, um, the first year I went there, you know, I did okay. And the second year that I went there, which was the last year that I went there, you know, you're staying at a dormitory at a college dormitory. You're like 15. And not only was it so fun playing the hockey and doing the tournaments and all that stuff, you know, the shenanigans were great. They, they were, they were great in the sense that like, they, they never really crossed the line. Like I had long hair at the time. Some guys tried to yeah. uh, break into our dorm to cut my hair from another team and I was sharing a room with a big old farm boy from up northern Ontario. And uh, when they got in the room, they accidentally went to his bunk and he cracked him <laughs> one foot in the head. And they all went scampering off before I even got out of bed. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like nothing like, you yeah. know, it just, it was just that moment. Where I just kind of like, 
I was a socially awkward kid. And it was just this moment where I was like, okay, this sport is like, I can get along. I can get along with the people and all the rest of it. I- I'm sorry. I'm going to have to hur- hurry up the questions. I'm at 8% battery. Yeah. The- <laughs> no, and, and we're almost done. So the next uh, one is what's the best chirp you've heard on the ice, off the ice, directed at you, not directed at you? I've got it. I've got one. There, there's one very obvious one. And when I was in the Fed uh, for the for the tryout uh, for the the camps, um, the average age of the players there was about nineteen to twenty three. Mm-hmm. Okay, the oldest goalie was probably about twenty seven or twenty eight. So after my period, I'm skating over to the bench, and I, I'm taking my old my good old time, and I'm being all brash about it. I just I just posted a shout out, so I'm feeling pretty good. And I get over to the bench and I was like, sorry about this, boys, but I'm raising the good looking factor of this bench by about 30%. And one guy shouts back at me, yeah, the average age, too. <laughs> that, that makes me want to try out for the Fed just to, uh, to raise the age of the whole team by about 10 years. <laughs> um, that was a good one. They got me good. Yeah, that, that is a good one. So, what is the uh, worst post game beer you've had? Don't drink. Good for you. So that then I'll change it. <laughs> what is the worst post game beverage? Ah, I don't know. I I tend to down my water bottle and then fill it up and down it again. So I don't know. Water's always good. Yeah, for me, I, I don't like Bio Steel. I don't like Gatorade. I just remember the old Powerade when it was still carbonated. Somebody gave that to me after a game once, and I was like, "What are you doing to me? This is terrible." Um. So when you tape your sick, do you go heel to toe or toe to heel? Heel to toe. Actually, not really heel to toe. I go one letter down from the Sherwood lettering. Okay. And I go around. Same Jose here. Theodore style. Yeah, I still tape that whole thing. And, and like I say, it's because I grew up using Christian sticks where you had to do that to preserve the stick. And it's not much of an issue anymore, but it is what it is. So two questions left. What's your favorite number to wear and why? Uh, 90. Nine, why 90? Dylan's phone cut out there before I was able to ask him what advice he has for young goalies. He was fun to chat with, and I can just imagine the confusion players have when they're bearing down on him on a breakaway and hear him singing show tunes. It would be great to have that on video. Be sure to follow Dylan at underscore Dylan and it's about W-A-U-G-H on Twitter and at Dylan Goalie Coach on Instagram. And be sure to follow the podcast at Hockey No Filter. You can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube simply by searching for Wash Up Goalie and I'll pop up. Visit washupgoalie.com for some great hockey-related content, my beer league hockey video highlights, and of course, all podcast episodes. Now that we're past uh, Halloween, Christmas is right around the corner. If you want some wash-up goalie or tendy talk apparel, be sure to visit my Threadless shop by clicking the merchandise link on the website. If you like this podcast, go listen to the BLPA Big Show. It's the OG BLPA Podcast Network show where a couple of beer league players talk beer league hockey, draft experience shenanigans, and exploits from around the game. Be sure to check out the full lineup of hockey-related podcasts on the Hockey Podcast Network as well. There are too many to list here, but shows like the Florida Hockey Podcast, the FLA Cats Podcast, and the Hockey Royalty Podcast can all be found. If you're looking for some something good to read, get yourself a subscription to Vintage Tendy Magazine. Published quarterly, the magazine takes a deep dive into an 80s or 90s era goalie. In the first five issues, they've covered guys like Felix Potvin, Grant Fuhr, Tim Chevelday, Jocelyn Tebow, Ken Reggett, John Van Beesbrook, even... Episode 20 guest, Mask Painter and Creator, Don Strauss. I'm keeping my eye on the mailbox as the next issues do due any day now with Darren Poopa. I need to thank the band Zamboni for allowing me to use their music on my episodes. You can download their music on iTunes or listen wherever you stream music from. I'm always working on lining up other goalies to talk to, and it's becoming harder and harder. If you're a goalie or have connections to a goalie, Shoot me an email at washupgoalie39 at gmail.com or send me a DM on social media. Let's not forget, if you're a brand who wants to sponsor the show, be sure to reach out to me. Be happy to talk. And finally, 
If you like what you hear, be sure to subscribe, rate, and comment on the podcast platform you're listening on. It's an easy action on your part that helps others find Tendy Talk. So, until next time, keep your stick on the ice and your body square to the puck. Good news? Well, Dave.